Well, hello and welcome to Columbia University's uh, Sociology Department. Uh, this is our video series on economics and uh, sociology and also going into other aspects of sociology. Uh, today we have uh, Professor Leslie McCall of Northwestern University and she will be speaking with us about her various projects dealing with political, uh, economic and also social inequality. Um, Welcome. Thank you for joining us for, for this uh, video talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so recently you gave a talk uh, at, at Columbia regarding your research on the undeserving rich in America. Um, what led you to that project um, and you know, what are your interests in, terms, in regards to that project? Um, well, I had done research on inequality. Um, actual earnings inequality and income inequality and as I was doing that book over the course of the 1990s, late 1990s, um, inequality was rising um, and I was became interested in at that time um, understanding the politics of the issue and curious about why there had been so much research on the topic within economics and somewhat in sociology but almost, we knew almost nothing about the extent to which it was an important public policy issue mm -hmm. or political issue. Um, and around the same time, in the early 2000s, political scientists became really interested in the, in the issue as well, both in terms of what are the policy and political solutions to inequality, as well as how could there be political causes, not just economic causes, but okay. political causes of, of inequality. And so I really began this research back then and um, with the question about whether Americans were aware of the trends in inequality and if so, what they thought about them because we really didn't have any information at that point about their views on the issue mm -hmm. and public opinion research hadn't focused on that topic yeah. either. Um, yeah. So that's where I began and, uh, and it has turned into um, research not just on the views about income inequality, but also about economic opportunity and then the social policies that are related to that. Uh, now you mentioned uh, public opinion. Mm -hmm. um, I remember that uh, you've worked with the General Social Survey. Mm -hmm. um, could you speak a little bit about that and you know, what that experience was and you know, what led you to that and um, just sort of the inner workings of the General Social mm -hmm. Survey? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, the, the data that I um, started working with uh, in you know, the early 2000s um, was from the General Social Survey. It's a long-running nationally representative survey of the American public. Um, it was started in the early 1970s. I mean, 1972 was the first survey and it was um, launched by uh, a sociologist, James Davis, and it has its purpose all along has been to chart trends, um, social trends to be the um, source for analyzing trends in social relationships and social attitudes over time. And so they emphasize the repetition of questions so that we can see how things have changed over time, which you can't tell if you change questions and yeah. change push or, or stop time series. So they're, they're, um, they've created an incredible resource of, of um, historical trends and trends over time and, and yeah. on a number of different areas. So for example, racial attitudes mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or attitudes about gender equality and yeah. whether women should work or whether they should take care of the children and all of these kinds of questions about abstractly supporting equal rights versus supporting specific policies that would create equal rights. And, yeah. um, and as it turned out, the General Social Survey was the best, it wasn't the only source, but it was the best source of questions on income inequality and on economic opportunity mm -hmm. and on social policy. In fact, it, it was the only data that asked questions about all three of those areas. Um, and but it was certainly the one that had originally I was drawn to it certainly the only one that had a time series replicated questions on beliefs about income inequality 
that started in 1987, luckily, mm -hmm. as a special module mm -hmm. um, launched by an international. The GSS also has an international counterpart. Yeah. The International Social Survey Program. Oh, I see. And and what countries are in? Oh, um, I you know there are maybe close to a hundred. I would say. Wow, and that's. I don't like know that that's world. true. Oh. Maybe fifty would be a better okay. guess. Okay. Um, it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot, and it's all over the world. Oh, great. Um, and the General Social Survey is a really central member of that organization. Okay. Um, and the International Social Survey Program launches various modules topical modules, mm -hmm. um, and they rotate it you know, year by year. Okay. And the modules that um, that I look at on income inequality began in 1987 and have been replicated every six or so years. Okay. And I think much of that module was developed by um, scholars in other countries, actually. I see. Um, but it was very, very fortunate because there, at 1987, Inequality had been rising, but we hadn't known yet. Yes. It wasn't publicized, it wasn't well known. Mm -hmm. and it's not even clear how well known it is now, mm -hmm. especially at that time. So, even though we would like something earlier that predates the actual rise in income inequality, which was around the early 80s, late 70s, this, the, the time period of 1987 can serve as a pretty good base. Yeah. Okay. So. Now, in, in, um, in reference to your work on inequality, you mentioned intersectionality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this seems to be uh, uh, sort of, so what, sort of a buzzword in sociology. Mm -hmm. um, for you know, students who are new to sociology, could you please explain what intersectionality means? Sure. And in the, and the ways it you know features in your research, or perhaps mm -hmm. the research of of, uh, of a scholar. Right. Um, well, it's a hard it, it's a hard question to answer, and a lot of people ask the question, "What is intersectionality?" And um, I'm I'm working on a paper that addresses that question and tries to define it more clearly. Um, but in a very rudimentary level, it usually includes an interest in working across dimensions of inequality um, and trying to. Uh, trying to use insights um, from uh, multiple dimensions of inequality to understand other dimensions of, of inequality. Um, and especially to, you know, some of the original motivation was to understand groups um, that hadn't been studied or, or groups that had, been had not been studied but then were assumed to be similar to mm -hmm. other groups. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the research on women, the early feminist research on women may have taken the perspective of white women or mm -hmm. white middle class women, mm -hmm. the argument went, and a lot, a lot of that was very true, um, and generalized based on white women's see, experiences um, to other women, different in class, different in race, different in sexuality. Um, and so intersectionality also means looking at a more representative, um, being wary of making generalizations from mm -hmm. one group to the other, and mm -hmm. looking at the experiences of people, especially who are in more marginal um, positions, socially, economically, and politically. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just as important to look at those people who are not often studied, but are in very powerful positions. I see. Because in some ways, we that's partly where the, going back to the original question about the mm -hmm. undeserving rich, um, every, every group is an intersectional group, you yeah. know? Um, so uh, that's true for white elite men um, as much as it is for poor Latina women. You know, so mm -hmm. I think that um, neither one is representative of either mm -hmm. all Latinas or all whites or all men or all those who are middle class or all those who are poor. Right? Mm -hmm. It's the intersection of those that makes those groups distinct, or at least that's a question. That's that. Is that true? And and what are the issues that are most important? What are the political issues, what are the economic issues and social issues that are most important for those groups and maybe that have not been addressed? Yeah. Um, so looking at under underrepresented in, mm -hmm. in re research as well as in, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, in, in our society. Okay. Um, well, one last question um, in regards to wage parity, mm -hmm. um, particularly at it, uh, Relates to gender. Um, yesterday was equal pay day. Mm -hmm. 
um, which was a day basically where women are supposed to stand up to the man before pay because, mm -hmm. you know, as you know, um, women generally make 75 cents to the dollar that men make. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the Obama administration has passed some laws to address this, you know, essentially making it illegal um, outright for women to be paid less for the same job mm -hmm. as a man. Mm -hmm. um, in your opinion, um, do you believe uh, such top-down policies are the way to go in terms of uh, addressing any kind of disparity, whether it be wage disparity or um, educational disparity? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what is your thinking? Do you believe those kinds of uh, top-down, legislative-driven uh, mm -hmm. uh, policies are what we need, or do you think it's something else? Sure, I think those are extremely helpful, and, and I think one way of thinking about it is not necessarily that it's a top-down um, or driven merely from, maybe a different way to think about it is that it's not driven merely from the top. So mm -hmm. if these are something like equal pay, that's a policy that um, unions, if, if you look at uh, the historical work that's been done mm -hmm. on women and for example, Dorothy Sue Cobble's work, um, that that there have been advocates from below for equal pay and for comp what's called comparable work, mm -hmm. which is being paid um, the same as uh, someone in a comparable job mm -hmm. who doesn't do exactly what we do but has comparable skills. Exactly. Um, and that's meant to address the different occupations that women work in. I see relative to men, mm -hmm. they would be very different occupations, they're not the same occupations, so equal pay wouldn't help necessarily to equalize the pay between those groups, um, but recognizing women's work is comparable mm -hmm. to men's work um, where appropriate would, would also lead to greater equity in pay between men and women, and that's something that uh, has, you know, you could think of it as coming from the top in the sense that it was an administratively imposed, usually in um, in states uh, and state um, employers, states as employers mm -hmm. would usually mandate mm -hmm. a, a comparable worth plan mm -hmm. for all state employees. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, so it seems top down, but on the other hand, where did it come from? Where did exactly. those demands come from originally? Equal pay has a very long history in the United States, and there's been a lot of activism mm -hmm. over the centuries <laughs> mm -hmm. um, for policies that equalize pay between men and women. Well, thank you very much um, for speaking with us, and um, I hope um, that um, this uh, talk has been enlightening for um, both our graduate and undergraduate students, and anyone who is interested in sociology. Um, thank you very much, Professor McCall. Thank you for having me.